Morning, boys and girls. Can you guess where I'm heading for today's adventure? Well done! I'm 
back in Australia. And boy, oh boy, is it hot. This time, we're not going to be in the outback, but rather, we're going to be exploring one of Australia's native forests. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Clue number one. I'm a muscular quadrupedal marsupial. Wow! Now that's a mouthful. Quadrupedal means I run on four legs. Marsupial means I belong to a group of mammals that carry our babies in a pouch. Clue number two. I have the most developed brain of any marsupial. Clue number three. I am a champion digger. My wide strong feet help me to dig lots of tunnels underground. I can move up to three feet of dirt in one day. Clue number four. I have teeth like a rodent. My incisors never stop growing, so I keep them under control by gnawing on bark and tough vegetation. Clue number five. I am mainly nocturnal, but I do sometimes go out to find food on overcast days. So boys and girls, have you got any idea who we are looking for? Not yet? Okay, here are some more clues. Clue number six. You can find me in the forested mountainous areas of southeastern Australia and Tasmania. Clue number seven. My closest relative is a koala. Clue number eight. I have a backwards facing pouch. Huh? This allows me to dig without getting dirty in my pouch. Clue number nine. I have a very tough bottom. When I'm in danger, I dive it first into my tunnel, blocking the entrance. I don't have a tail, which makes it difficult for a predator to grab me. Clue number 10. Good luck trying to stop me when I'm running. I can run up to 40 kilometers per hour and keep that speed for up to 90 seconds. Clue number 11. When I'm gathered in a group, it's called a wisdom. Clue number 12. After a good meal, it can take up to six days to digest my meal. There you go. Any idea yet? What's that you say? You're right. Well done. I am a wombat. Well done, boys and girls. I'm normally a tough one to guess, but you got it right. I'm really proud of my family. So here are some pictures of them. That's me. That's my dad, Cedric, and my mom, Bethany. That's my big brother, Zach. That's my little sister, Roxy. And those are the twins, Gucci and Armani. Here are some more interesting facts about me. The oldest and heaviest wombat was Patrick the Bear-Nosed Wombat, who lived at the Ballarat Wildlife Park. He lived to be 31 years and weighed 68 kilograms. This makes him the weight of around four koalas combined. Although I'm generally quiet, if I become angry, I make a hiss sound and there are reports of humans being hurt from wombat attacks. My babies are born after only 21 days. They aren't fully developed though when they're born, so they live in my pouch for another six to seven months drinking my milk. Now this is a weird fact, 
But I have square poop. Ew! I mark my territory by stacking my poop. It's square so it doesn't roll away. Clever, eh? Hey? Lastly, in my family tree we have three different types of wombats. I come from a group called the Common Wombat. My grandfather's family comes from the Northern Hairy-Nosed Wombat. My grandmother's family comes from the Southern Hairy-Nosed Wombat. Wow! How amazing was that, boys and girls? The backward-facing pouch. How cool is that? I try not to brag about it, but it is rather special, isn't it? Isn't it amazing how Jesus created the wombat? And he knew that a normal pouch wouldn't work. So he created a backward-facing one to protect the little baby inside. God never forgets the little details. The wombat may be small and look helpless, but Jesus made sure that they were able to protect themselves. In the same way, Jesus will always be close to you to protect you. Remember that he loves you lots and lots, and that he made you for a special purpose. That's all for this week, boys and girls. See you soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye.
it is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice that deals with our sins. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Son, Kami Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Bukushi Balana, and I will be doing the offertory reading for today. Let all that you do be done in love. God, because of his love for mankind, emptied heaven so that we can have life and life in abundance. He sent his son to give us a memorandum on how to lead our lives. He also tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that we should look up to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are all here because we believe that Jesus is King of Kings, and our aim is to mimic his footsteps. Galatians 2.20 reads, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Life I live now, I live in my body. I live by faith, indeed, by the faithfulness of God's Son who loved me and gave himself for me. Therefore, give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love endureth forever. He who took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners, he called you, he said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. He says, do not fear for he is with you. Do not be dismayed for he is your God. He will strengthen you and help you. He, he will uphold you with his righteous hand for he is God the Lord who takes care or who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that fires by day. For as many are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen. To the glory of God through us and being fully assured that what God has promised, he was also able to perform. Matthew 6 also says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others as to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Remember the story of the poor lady who cast two mites into the treasury of the Lord, who gave all she had with love, faith, and benevolence, trusting that God's care for the, I mean, rather, trusting in, to God's care for the uncertain future. Now in giving, don't just give so that you can be seen. Do not give for attention. Give out of love because you or because you have faith in God. Give because you trust and believe that God will carry you through. Give so that the gospel will reach all the four corners of the earth. Give so that there will be food in the house of the Lord for God loves a cheerful giver. It is not the greatest gift that makes the offering acceptable to God. It is the purpose of the heart, the spirit of gratitude and love that it expresses. Let not the poor feel like their gifts are so small as to be unworthy to um, of notice. Let them each give according to their ability, feeling that they are servants of God and that he will accept their offering. This is found in um, Heavenly Places, page 304. Now, don't get this wrong. God is not asking you to use your whole salary. He's merely asking you to trust him. He paved the way for you. He emptied heaven for you. He carried you through tough times. The 10% is not you doing God a favor. The 10% shows that you remember God's place in your life and you're letting him take control. Yes, you have debts to pay. Yes, you have mouths to feed, but why do you worry about that? See how the flowers of the fields grow. They do not labor or spin. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, ye of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. And when you go down the book of Matthew, it reads, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles on its own. See, your bank and credit card statements are just theological documents. They tell who and what you worship. 
After all is said and done, what are we going to say about these things? One thing I know is that if God is for us, who is against us? Nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God. He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also freely give us all the things with him? Lastly, with the price of everything else going up these days, I am not glad that God has not increased the tithe to 10%. Keep that in mind. Shall we all bow our heads in prayer? <sighs> Dear Lord, thank you for the reminder that you have given us. Please um, teach us to fully trust in you and to also give more time. All this I pray in the wonderful name of our Son, and Savior Jesus Christ. Once again, Lord, we've assembled to worship. We've been drawn by your love, your mercy, and your grace. We've come to express our deep gratitude for your salvation offered so freely in Jesus. We've come to show our appreciation for life's present blessings, for future hopes. We invite your Holy Spirit, to bless us with his ministry of conviction, guidance, teaching, and comfort as we worship in Jesus' name. And therefore, I also ask you to touch my lips, that the words that I speak be glorified to your name. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I was truly touched by a story of an American lady with the name Wilma Rudolph from Tennessee. Wilma was born prematurely, weighing just over two kilograms on the 23rd of June, 1940. She should have died, but she didn't. Not long after she was born, she contracted pneumonia, almost certain death for an infant, but against all odds, she survived. Not much later, she battled against scarlet fever. At age six, she contracted polio, which left her in a wheelchair. Wilma was from a large family of 22 children, and her brothers and sisters played basketball. One day, while Wilma was watching her brothers and sisters playing from her wheelchair. She began to cry and told her mother that she will never be able to play like her brothers and her sisters. Her mother told her that she was a miracle child and that she would walk again, but 
She had to believe it. By age 11, Wilma was out of her wheelchair. Age 12, she was out of her leg brace. And by the age of 13, she was playing basketball with her brothers and her sisters. But her success didn't end there. At age 14, she began to run. Age 15, she started to run really fast. And at age 16, she was extraordinary. Four years later, at the age of 20, Wilma Rudolph was the fastest lady on this planet. She won three gold medals at the Olympics in 1960. Wilma not only ran in the Olympics of 1960, but she also ran in a race of life with endurance, having faith that she could accomplish which the doctor said was impossible. Today, many people believe that it's impossible to run in the race of life with endurance. However, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, Paul gives us the secret which each one of us must have of running the race with endurance. We cannot run the race on our own strength. And here in Hebrews, Paul gives us three areas where we should fix our eyes upon if we would like to run the race of endurance. Paul starts in Hebrews 12 verse 1 by saying, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witness surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The first area that Paul highlights is that we must fix our eyes upon the witnesses. Paul starts off by using the word kai haimais, which means to place emphasis on something or to express something clearly. He says that we all have a great multitude of witnesses which surrounds us and we should fix our eyes upon them. Paul's emphasis on witness is twofold. Firstly, this cloud of witnesses can be found in the previous chapter, where Paul lists the names of men and women from the Old Testament who were examples of great faith. Men and women like Enoch, who went to heaven without dying. Noah spent his life warning people of a flood that no one believed could ever happen. Abraham, who followed God even though he did not know where the path would lead him. Sarah received strength to give birth as a mature lady. Joseph was sold and later thrown into jail. Moses forsook, forsook Egypt and led God's people through the Red Sea on dry ground. And Rahab, the harlot who protected two spies. Secondly, the Greek for witness translated also means martyr, which means one who by his death bears witness to the truth. Someone like Stephen who stood for the truth no matter what, even at a moment when he knew that he's going to die, he still pleaded with God not to hold the sin against him. Paul knew that we cannot run this race by ourselves. Therefore, he places great emphasis on the fact that we do have examples to look at when we think that we are all alone without any motivation. Just as these witnesses had to forsake their own sinful habits, we too must lay aside those sins which entangles us. Athletes in the biblical times used to practice with weights on. And when it became time to run the race, they would take the weights off. 
but also anything else that would entangle them. Sometimes these contestants would often run naked to ensure that nothing would hinder them from completing the race and from winning the race. Just before I became a born-again Christian, I used to be a heavy drunk. I used to drink from the morning when I woke up until the evening when I go to bed. And this was a major weight restricting me to run the race with endurance. Once I accepted Jesus into my life, I was able to lay aside that sin which entangled me. But apart from this major challenge which I had, I still battle to lay aside all of these daily sins we tend to have. Sins like pride, covetousness, anger, and you could add a couple more. Friends, if we want to run the race of endurance successfully, then we must lay aside all these so-called little sins which we cherish on a daily basis. We must take off the weights which are dragging us down. We must strip ourselves of anything that could hinder us from finishing the race, even if it means that we should stop watching that favorite TV show that we like to watch, or stop hanging out with some friends who have negative influence on our lives. Paul says that we must run the race with endurance. Looking at the great heroes of Hebrews chapter 11, it is clear that they did not always have everything together. They also struggled with the same temptations of life as we do. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was a liar. Moses lost his temper. Rahab was a harlot. And King David had an affair. However, they laid aside everything which entangled them on a daily basis and stayed in the race. Friends, for them, it was not a sprint. For them, it was a long-distance marathon. We will have days when we fall down. But by fixing our eyes on the witnesses who surround us, We can and shall win the race. Now, Paul continues in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2, by saying, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The second area Paul highlights is that we must fix our eyes upon Jesus. The Greek word here for author is agagon, which means a chief leader, author, captain, or prince. In this context of running the race, it suggests that Jesus is the author or an initiator of true faith since he opens the way to God and enables us to follow in his footsteps. I do not have any faith of my own. There's nothing in my life that can produce faith. But when my eyes, brothers and sisters, are fixed upon Jesus, I have faith through Jesus who gives it to me. Now, I'm sure that each one of you would be able to give testimonies of how God provided for you through faith. It is only by faith that we are able to face times of trouble. Troubles like uncertainty of work, lack of finances, challenges at home or with family, and any other attack the devil might want to throw at you and at me. One of the experiences I had while studying here at Halliburton College 
was that one day we did not have any food to eat. In fact, my bank account was on empty. Only 20 rand to my name. And I said to my wife, with two teenagers in the house, to take the 20 rand and go and buy a bread. While she is away, I was busy sweeping the yard, and a message came through on my phone. When I looked, I saw that somebody paid in 1,000 rand into my account. And the reference is for whatever is needed. I quickly phoned my wife and I told her, listen, buy any food that you need for the house as there is a thousand rand in our account. And throughout the four years at Helderberg College, I've seen one after another miracles happening, not only to me, but also to the fellow students at the campus. Now I'm sure that each one of you who are listening to my voice this morning, will be able to share testimonies of how God has provided for you, especially during the last two years. Friends, we should focus on the life of Jesus and the ultimate example of faith he was for us. And as a result, we will have more faith. Just before the crucifixion of Jesus, he went to the garden to pray. Jesus asked his disciples to pray with him. But his disciples were tired and they fell asleep. That evening, Jesus was in agony as the pressure of the world laid on his shoulders. The pressure was so heavy on him that he even started to sweat blood. He asked his father that if it was his will, that this cup would pass him. But in faith, Jesus said that he still will do his father's will. Looking at a cross, Jesus knew that this was the only way that we as sinners could be saved. Crucifixion was reserved for slaves and the lowest types of criminals who walked on this earth. Jesus did not focus on the shame and dishonor the cross represented. Instead, he saw the joy which will come after the cross when sinners like you and me would have the privilege of being saved. In faith, Jesus endured the race. He rose from the grave and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. He received his gift of claiming the right to take our sins upon him, and in the process to save a lost race. By fixing our eyes upon Jesus, we know that by faith, we too can endure the race, and ultimately, Receive the gift of all gifts, eternal life. Now, Paul continues in verse 3 by saying, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. The third area Paul highlights is that we must fix our eyes upon persevering. Now, Paul shifts now his attention to Jesus as the ultimate example of perseverance. Every kind of attack we could receive from Satan, Jesus already endured on our behalf. At first, Jesus was loved and everyone followed him. Everyone wanted to be with Jesus. Everyone wanted to listen what Jesus had to say. But soon, those who loved him, those who followed him, those who wanted to be with him, 
denied him, and ultimately crucified him. The weight of the world was squarely on Jesus' shoulders, but by faith he persevered. Friends, life itself keeps on placing hurdles in our way. There will be days in our lives where we feel persecuted by those we love. There will be days in our life that we feel that we do not want to get out of bed in the morning. There will be days in our lives where we feel that our prayers hit the ceiling and that Jesus do not hear them. There will be days in our lives that we will be persecuted by those we meet, those we work with, and those we love. There will be days in our lives that we do not feel to go to church. Days might come when Satan's attack is so severe that you do not feel like being a Christian anymore, that you feel that you do not want to continue in the race of life, in the race of faith, by persevering and moving forward. But remember that our situation we are in are not different or unique. Just as Jesus kept his faith, endured the race, and claimed his prize. So you and I also have to keep persevering, fixing our eyes on Jesus, and run with faith. Jesus gave us a powerful promise in John chapter 16, verse 33, where he said that in the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Friends, there's nothing that Satan can do or throw at you or bring in front of you which you will not be able to overcome through the strength of Christ. Jesus gave us a promise in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. And he says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. I've read amazing testimony this week of a man called Ado Niram Judson. Now, from here on, I'm going to call him as short as AJ. Ado Niram Judson as AJ. Now, AJ was a pastor's son, born in 1788. And when he was three years old, his dad came back home and his mom says, Come, listen, listen. And the boy took the Bible and read the whole chapter from the Bible. To his father's amazement, he said that one day, AJ will be a great man. This statement stayed with AJ. He taught himself Greek and Latin in his preteen years. Later in his life, he attended the seminary. But during this time, there was one verse that kept on standing out for him. It kept on coming back to him. And that was Matthew chapter 28, verses 19. And it says there, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, during his studies, he read about the mission field, and how it's needed to send missionaries into the mission field. So he decided to be a missionary in Burma. When he went to his folks and told them 
that he will be going to Burma as a missionary for life, his parents were shocked. AJ and his friends were invited to visit the home of a prominent church member. And at the house, he met a lady by the name of Anne, a 16-year-old who also had a burden for a mission. AJ and Anne started to write letters to each other, getting to know each other, and soon they fell in love. And one day he decided to write her a letter expressing that he would like to spend the rest of his life with Anne. And in this letter, he asked her if he can give her a life of sacrifice in a foreign mission field. After that, he wrote a letter to her parents to ask permission to marry Anne. Now, his, his letter to, to her parents were a little bit unusual, and this is what he wrote to them. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring, to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her subjection to the hardships and suffering of a missionary's life, to every kind of want and distress, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with the crown of righteousness brightened with the acclamations of praise which should redound to her Savior from heavens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. Anne's parents were willing to allow Anne to make her own decision, and she approved. Less than a year later, in 1812, AJ married Anne. The pastor at the wedding ceremony committed them to God's care and committed them to the grave. This was both their wedding ceremony and their funeral. The next day, AJ were ordained and commissioned. After this, they traveled first to India and then to Burma. Adoniram started to translate the Bible into Burmese, and Anne started a school for both boys and girls in Burma. AJ started to teach the scripture to a few people, and soon more and more people came to them. Six years after their first arrival at Burma, they had the first convert who were willing to be baptized. At one stage, war broke out between Burma and England. The king ordered that all the spies must be thrown into jail. The soldiers came to AJ's house and they captured him, believing that he were a spy. And he spent the next 11 months in jail. Less than a month after Adoniram were thrown into jail and discovered that she was pregnant with a baby girl. Same time, the soldiers of Burma came and searching for material which the spies would have sent to England. Afraid of the, that the soldiers will find the scriptures that Adoniram have translated she took them and put them into a pillow. Not knowing exactly what to do, she decided to take it to AJ 
in jail, believing that that will be the place where it's the most safest. One day, when Anne came to the prison, she discovered that they were no longer there. Adunaram were stripped from all his belongings, his shoes, his shirt, and he only had on pants. Even his pillow was taken away where the translations of the Bible were in. And they were taken to a town close by. Anne came to the prison and she saw that they are no longer there. The Burma commander intended to bury them alive. But at the same time, England and Burma started to negotiate, realizing that Adoniram were fluent in both English and Burmese. They decided to call him and to ask him to help them with the negotiations. A while after that, they were at home wondering what's the next step. And the cook came to them with a pillow that he found with the translations of the Bible inside. In 1826, Anne died from a sudden sickness, just 14 years after they were married. Their daughter, aged two, also passed away that same year. Not long after that, in 1837, Adoniram baptized 1,144 Burmese converts through their ministry. Even through all the heartaches, hardships, everything that the devil threw at Adoniram and his family, he persevered in faith, standing strong, and following Jesus. Friends, Adoniram and Anne were only able to stand against the attacks from the devil by remembering how God protected the pioneers of faith and by having faith in Jesus no matter what the outcome might have been. By so doing, they persevered in faith and therefore we must run the race of life with our eyes set upon Jesus and remember that he can and will lead us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our Father. We thank you for giving us the strength to be able to stand during times of trouble. We thank you for giving us faith, especially at times when we do not have the strength to continue. Therefore, we ask that you will be with us during this week. We ask that you will touch those who might have a challenging time at the moment. Father, I ask that you will touch those who feel that they cannot and they do not have the strength to continue. Father, I ask that you will not only touch them, but that you will hold them and that they will feel the love that you have, that they will feel the comfort, that they will feel the security, knowing that no matter what happens in this world, through faith in Jesus, they will be able to endure anything, even, even if it happens like in the life of Adoniram, who has lost his family, but persevered through faith. Father, therefore, as we close the service today, I want to place your children before you. 
with their burdens, with their troubles, knowing that a healing hand is ready to touch them. And so now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.